Okay, I think for the purpose of sticking to schedule, we will start. We've got two terrific papers. Um, first of all, we'll um, hear from um, Don Devene. He's going to talk about the cosmic tradition, uh, Barlet and de Sarac. And then Oret Cohen paper uh, will uh, focus on faith versus reason and the cosmology of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor and Boaz. Will you be reading that? Uh -huh. So what we'll do is we will have um, both papers and we'll have um, questions after each paper and then we will um, finish at four. So I will um, hand it over to Pat. Um, I, I have always been uh, puzzled over why the grand old man of French occultism at the turn of the 20th century, one of the first chosen to expound the cosmic philosophy, a man who instructed new disciples in the philosophy and its practice, the first editor of the Revue Cosmique and of the first volumes of Tradition Cosmique, a man who was a disciple of Max Theon for seven years, dropped Theon like a hot potato, dropped him instantaneously to follow a notorious and flagrant confidence man. Now, um, we all know what a confidence man is. Um, it's a swindler who gains your trust, gains the trust of a dupe or a mark as they call him, by telling him what he most wants to hear and then uses that trust to defraud him. In the case of the kind man who works in the field of the occult, and we could call him perhaps uh, a mage confidence man or a confidence man mage as it were, he then proves the, the validity of his claims by working wonders to lure the victim. One of the people I wanted to discuss today falls into the category of an occult confidence man. It's Alberto de Serra, Comte de Das. Serra was in many ways, as we'll find out, an archetype of the confidence man mage and managed to ensnare many respected occultists around the world, notably for present purposes, Francois Charles Barlet who should have known better. This is Barlet about 1897. Um, he was for a quarter of a century the most revered figure in the French occult revival at the end of the 19th century, venerated as such by all of his younger contemporaries. In essence, he was a seeker, a searcher. Excuse me, a searcher after occult realization and unfoldment fundamentally convinced that he himself and the world around him were less than or other than they could be or should be, that something was missing and that there was more to life than the ordinary world around them, a lack he could remedy if he could only find the key, the secret that he was certain had to exist somewhere in the hands of masters. This led him from one occult group to another throughout his life. All were embraced enthusiastically and followed until disillusionment set in. Disillusionment, I um, emphasize here, not caused by disbelief in the doctrines expounded by his various masters, none of which he seems ever to have ex rejected explicitly, but rather driven by the sad realization that words and descriptions, however sage and seemingly true, were still secondhand retellings of what someone else had seen and experienced. In his writings, he was above all a synthesizer, trying to arrange coherently the occult teachings he encountered in his studies. And beyond the doctrines he espoused lay for him the wonders of initiation and personal experience and the development of man's innate powers by occult practice. Here, beyond the theoretical, he said in 1890, begin the practical secrets which must lead to ecstasy and the taking of possession of extraterrestrial forces. These secrets are delivered only individually from initiator to initiate. This is what he looked for his whole life and what he didn't find. In October 1885, he became acquainted <coughs> for the first time with the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, the HB of L, which was an order of practical occultism as it styled itself, set up to establish exterior centers in the West 
for reviving the rights of each and initiation. It was organized in Britain by Peter Davidson and Thomas Henry Burgoyne with the eminent and unknown Max Theon as the Grand Master of the Exterior Circle. Barlet was soon provincial Grand Master for France. When the HV of L came crashing down in the late 1880s on the exposure of fraud by its principals, Barlet, its principal Davidson and Burgoyne, Barlet stood firm in his respect, respect for Davidson and the HB of L. Whatever the details of his personal experience and achievement in the order may have been, it was sufficient to make him to continue to revere it, though with inner doubts as to his own experience. As he wrote Papus in 1895, I tell you, for example, that I have been quite wrapped in the most absolute blackness recently. I found myself so beaten down that I asked myself if I was worthy and capable of continuing, doing nothing in occultism except burying my head and awaiting the final downfall that always threatens me. Despite repeated failures, Barlet continued hopeful. This is the hopeful Barlet. Uh, Max Theon, the Grand Master of the Exterior Circle of the HBFL, vanished from the scene of the HBFL even before the collapse, collapse of the order. And for more than a decade, he was out of the public eye. He emerged from total obscurity in 1899 and reappeared with a bang designed to bring him to the attention of, the French, of French occultism. Without any preamble or any mention of a connection with the HB of L, he became one of the, quote, principal collaborators, end quote, in the Journal du Magnetisme, which basically became a propaganda organ for Theon. Throughout 1899, the journal published long articles by Theon, all emphasizing that occult practice and results were central to what it was teaching. Here is Theon, 1899. We belong to this practical nation of the North, whose proverb is facts rather than words. Discourses, writings, philosophical schools, and theories are innumerable, but it is effective practical work that is lacking for all ardent searchers after the truth. But the promised reward is the pearl of great price. That is the restitution and consequent immortality of men. And those who sell all to possess it, to obtain it, are the truly wise. If this was not enough to attract public attention to Theon, in October of 1899, the journal, the, the journal published a double issue with a vast attack by Theon on the absurdity of Cardus' spiritism, the ultimate heresy in France at the time, which produced a firestorm in the spiritist press. Theon was barred from the journal but his goal was realized. He had gone from being an unknown to being a household name among French occultists. Coincidentally with the furor in the spiritualist press, Theon appeared in the first issue of the new L'Eco de l'Odela de in October 1899, this time as he appeared as Dr. Max Theon, who, who it was announced would collaborate with the journal on theosophy. Barlet had, Barlet had nowhere appeared in all of this, but he and his reputation were crucial to Theon's efforts to spread word of the cosmic philosophy. He entered the picture in June 1900 when he took over editing L'Echo de l'Odela. That's uh, L'Echo de l'Odela. That summer, as Christian Chanel informs us, Barlet traveled to Algeria to meet the Theons, repeating the trip the next year. At the beginning of 1901, Barley began to hold regular conferences at his apartment to present the cosmic philosophy to his friends in the Parisian occult world, conferences that were coupled with periods of quiet meditation and practice in accordance with the teachings of the cosmic philosophy. When Leco ceased at the end of 1900, it was replaced by two journals, both edited by Barley, most notably the Revue Cosmique, of which he became the first editor. From the beginning, the journal emphasized the dual nature of occultism, theoretical and practical, but stressed the primacy of the former, theory. As it explained in its first, his first issue, our readers will not eat the dessert before the soup. In accordance with this view, the journal poured out to its readers 
in mind-numbing detail the doctrines of the cosmic philosophy, all garbed in the mixture of neologisms and incomprehensible terms that we associate with it. When it came to practical realization of the possibilities inherent in the psycho-intellectual man, however, the journal and the other writings of the cosmic philosophy at the time were largely reduced to writing about the practice and the results. But beyond the theory and practice described in the journal was the promise of what Barlet had been seeking since he joined the HB of L 15 years before, initiation, which the journal called both serious and sacred, available at promise to those who desire and are capable of it from the masters themselves. The movement was emphatic that, this is a quote, uh, the greatest proof which a doctrine can furnish, and in a sense the only one with real value, is the practical results to which it leads. One can only judge a tree by its fruits. It was always noted that this progress toward direct initiation by the masters was progressive and difficult, but it very quickly became clear that realization of these promises was not easily achieved in man's present state. And it would seem that in Barlet's case, the cosmic philosophy for all its doctrinal revelations did not satisfy the transformative experience and satisfaction he desired. Barlet nonetheless continued to revere Theon as the link to the masters, preserving a hopeful attitude, a wait and see attitude, as he said in the journal, um, willing to wait proof of what had been promised in the cosmic philosophy. Um, as late as 1907 in September, he could still write, I am particularly attached, as you know, to this cosmic philosophy, which I consider to be the total synthesis. The next month, however, everything changed when Barlet met Sarah. Life is not long enough to recount the exploits of Albert de Serra. He was a confidence man in mage, and for 35 years, from the early 1880s until his death in 1919, he exercised his wiles on three continents, leaving in his wake assumed names, abandoned wives and mistresses, plagiarized books and journals that he published uh, all across the Western world, shifting occult claims and doctrines, exposures, unpaid bills, jail cells, unfulfilled promises, and disillusioned dupes and disciples, many of whom, like Barlet, continued to hold him in awe even after catching him in fraud. In his later days, he usually gave his name as Dr. Alberto de Serac, Comte de Das, almost no part of which is genuine, although his name may have been Albert. Over the, years, <laughs> over the years, he used a variety of names to conceal his identity. Here's a selection, <laughs> which is not at all complete. As did so many of his contemporary mages, who embroidered their plebeian origins, Sarah claimed variously to have been born in India or Tibet, the son of the Raja of Sindang Serac, and, and a French marchioness. Uh, or the son of a noble Count de Das, or in Spain, the scion of a noble exiled Carlos family. In reality, he was almost certainly Charles Alberto Scalupi, um, an Italian uh, prestidigitator, stage mes mesmerist, and confidence man, who by the early 1880s had already been jailed 11 times in Italy for fraud and theft a pattern he was to continue throughout his life. The birth date he gave varied from 1844 to 1868, depending on what he was trying to convey at the time. Truth was absolutely irrelevant to him. <laughs> Barley is proof that an aspiring mage did not need education, learning, integrity, or creative intelligence in order to succeed. His speeches were cliched as public demonstrations of occult powers were frankly laughable, and his books and magazines were largely plagiarized from Jules Dupotet, Louis Jacques Oliot, and H.P. Blavatsky. 
His doctrine centered on the universal vital fluid, or ode, or agasha, or agasa, or akasha, and its cultivation and direction by the will, which enabled the student to work wonders like the masters. Uh, this is ode, in case you are interested. What Serac did have going for him was shamelessness and a masterful ability to publicize himself and an amazing grasp of human nature that allowed him intuitively to understand the moods and desires of his audience and the theatrical needs of the situation. He was a genius in incorporating whatever came to his notice, notably magical mesmerism, the right of Memphis, uh, the right of misery, rather, and theosophy, and of turning that to his benefit. When he first appeared in the newspapers in early 1880s in France, there was no hint of mystical Tibet or secret masters. He was a stage mesmerist, complete with scantily clad young ladies as subjects. And he also offered private magnetic consultations to privileged clients. In between appearances, he also sold diplomas and bogus orders of chivalry all over France, which caused him yet another imprisonment in Marseille in 1885 where he was a defendant under the name of Sartini. The Spanish novelist Mario Rosso de Luno said of, uh, uh, of uh, Serac's uh, past, and the success of his arrival in the country was never less than, than his, the disaster of his departure from it, always with the police hot on his heels. On his emergence from jail in Marseille, uh, Serac spent 25 vagabond years as he moved back and forth across Spain and Portugal, where he appeared, appeared before the Queen in each country, uh, Belgium, South America, North America, Mexico, and France, becoming in turn the Comte de Das and then Alberto de Serac, Comte de Das, professor of occultism in La Hassa College, then the general delegate of the Supreme Council of the Mahatmas of Tibet or sometimes, Inspector General in the West of the Supreme Council of the Order of Oriental Initiation for the West, etc. He always dressed the part. This is, this is Serac about 1902 uh, in front of an altar, his altar. Now Serac had a bag of tricks that he trotted out at his initial public appearances in a new city. And by 1900, they were decidedly old hat and embarrassingly inept, especially as he grew older. He painted mystic pictures blindfolded while in trance, produced goldfish brains, goldfish from grains of caviar, materialized messages from Tibet, produced photographs of astral bodies and spirits, and caused seeds to germinate under his hands. Here he is germinating some seeds, seeds mystically in front of an audience. Uh, here is one of his uh, trance uh, paintings, which is frankly awful. <laughs> um, and here, in case you were ever curious, uh, is a photograph that he took, he developed the uh, pictures himself, of, of an astral body. Uh, and finally, um, here are two spirits that he communed with variously over the years called Justice and Filippo. Um, these also were frankly awful and would have caused the spirit uh, photographer Mumler 50 years before to be embarrassed. They're so bad. In 1907, in October, Serac this time appearing as Orama, appeared in Paris with great fanfare. He gave his customary lectures and demonstrations for fees ranging from 10 pounds to 40 pounds a person to a storm of publicity. But as elsewhere, he invited at the assistance of his masters in Tibet, a favored few into his inner circle to be initiated into the holy order of the Supreme Council of Tibet holding out to them the promise of developing further what he assured them were their already impressive psychic powers, and distributing elaborate diplomas replete with a block of Sanskrit text 
printed upside down, I might add, as I'm informed by a Sanskritist, um, to those who succumb to his wiles. Serac's greatest miracle was direct communication with the masters in the presence of his awed disciples. By the time he appeared in Paris, he had already had, he had long had the ability uh, to commune with the masters, but by the time he got to Paris, he learned the ability to photograph the masters mm -hmm. astrally. Um, although presumably, as with his other mystic photographs, he always retained the negatives himself and developed them. <laughs> Here is a photograph of a master, presumably his master Saki, S-A-K-I, <laughs> that was made during an esoteric seance of a lodge meeting of his inner circle in Paris in November of 1908, at which Barlet was almost undoubtedly yes, present. Yes, Serac um, totally captivated Barlet, telling him exactly what Barlet wanted to hear about connections with Tibetan masters and promises of initiation, and proved his claims by miracles. Overwhelmed by the demonstrations of Serac's powers, at the end of 1907, so that's two months after uh, Barlet was on record in Voile DC saying that he thinks of uh, the Traditium Cosmique as the total synthesis of occult knowledge. Two months later, um, Barlet helped found the Eastern Esoteric cent Center of France to propagate Serac's teachings, um, and the journal L'Etoile d'Orient, which became the origin of the organ, rather, of Serac's teachings in France, and again with Barlet as editor. Here's Barlet looking um, editorial in 1908. Barlet emphasized in the journal the certitude created by Serac's demonstrations and the worth of his teachings themselves. Let me be permitted to invoke the experience acquired by 50 years of study of the true mysteries when I affirm that the revelations which have always successfully offered, which have always successfully offered more, uh, offered, have given us more light, more power, more certitude in the authenticity of their source, and that the teachings of our honored Dr. Serac are at the peak of this ascending series of teachings. By the spring of 1908, Serac had fallen out in the press. In his latest venture, was following the path of his efforts over the preceding 20 years. Deprived of fresh recruits uh, to get money from, Serac milked those he already had. The bylaws of the Oriental Esoteric Center in France required members to support Serac financially. In 1910, facing eviction, he said, from his lodgings, he beseeched a member of the group for money, buttressing his impassioned pleas with telegrams, supposedly sent by Barlet. The master will be seized. We have raised nearly a thousand. This is urgent. We stand behind this, Barlet. Here's one of the telegrams. When this resulted in only 500 francs from some poor duke, Serac tried again with an official order of the group, supposedly signed by Barlet and others, asking for more money. Here's the official order. The first signature there is uh, Barlet's signature under his real name, Fauchou. These frauds forced Barlet to come forward to reveal that the signatures on the documents that had been used to beguile the Duke were forgeries and not his. His hopes were dashed once more, and he abandoned yet another master. After the revelations of his fraud in France, Serac departed for Uruguay, Switzerland, Brazil, and then the United States. And he returned to France in 1919 and died in Monaco on December 10th of that year and was buried there under the name of Alberto de Serac, a name which by that time he must have come to accept as his own. After his disillusionment with Barlet, with Serac, Barlet still retained a holy fear of Serac's powers, and a belief in his experiences with him. His friend Thomas, George uh, Thomas, said, it was always with a certain trembling in his voice 
that he told of the almost fabulous experiences he had had with this magician, he retained a holy apprehension of the astral and the evil forces it contained. This is Barley's last known photograph in 1921, uh, the year that he died. In his last years, Barley seems to have withdrawn into himself. He largely abandoned writing except on astrology and turned as had so many disillusioned occult, disillusioned occultists before and since to mysticism and religion, abandoning, as his friend René Guénon said, all belief in the pretensions of, of organizations that promise true initiation. Now, I think we can learn a few things of general application other than just the uh, facts of Xerox and Barley's life. Uh, I believe there are a few lessons of general application we can learn from the encounter of Barley and Xerox. The first is that hope and expectation and belief uh, in the possibility of transformative experience trump common sense. The second is that neither learning nor prior experience is a ward against the will of the wisp seduction and hope for transforming occult experience. Barlet was not alone in continuing to revere or fear Serac after catching him in fraud. I'll name here only uh, a few, Fernand de Bois, uh, Arnolo Crumheller, uh, who founded the Fraternitas Raza Cruciana Antigua, Agnes Marslin in the United States, and Alejandro Sarando in Argentina. The third uh, general lesson I think we can learn is that words and doctrines, however much the seeker is convinced that, that they supply the synthesis of truths, are insufficient without more. And one set of doctrines is easily substituted for another. Doctrines, in other words, for people in the position of Barley, who's a seeker, are decidedly secondary to what he's really looking for, which is experience. In the end, what real difference does it make for the seeker to understand the intricacies of the neologisms and genealogies of the cosmic philosophy? In this respect, they seem to play the same role as the revelations of books like Ohaspe, or the Urantia book, or the holy theomonistic Bible, and the like. Without more, they were curiosities and irrelevant to what the seeker wanted, even if deemed true. The fourth uh, general thing I think we can draw from their encounter is that reading about or being told about something by another bows to seeing with one's own eyes and one's own experiences, however deluded that experience might be. Finally, um, as takeaway messages from the encounter of Barley and Sarah, I would urge that we perhaps too narrowly constrict our research as scholars if we concentrate on doctrines and ideas and their origins and permutations to the exclusion of experience and satisfaction or the search for these. Also, I think we make a mistake as scholars if we do not include the confidence man the confidence man mage in this case, as a category in our thinking. Confidence men are omnipresent um, in the occult world, especially in the last hundred years, and played and continue to play a principal role in the worlds of occultism and spiritualism. I want to thank Boaz Hus and uh, Asher Benjamin for, for inviting uh, me here and for the Israeli Science Foundation for for providing the funding for this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.